Good morning, good afternoon, good night. We will take a little more minutes or time, short time to have the attendees uh, participating or logging in. And then we will kick off. Okay, so I'm Johan Palmers. Um, I am your host of the day. And uh, firstly, I would like to welcome you to our first uh, Beckert webinar. Uh, some of you might know that we had already in the past uh, two technical seminars in Belgium and Ghent, but due to COVID, we were not able to organize this uh, this year. And that's why we are shifting at this moment to uh, the webinar uh, situation. Now, the webinar today is, um, has a subject of improving car glass app optics for future augmented reality head-up displays. And as you know, uh, head-up display has been initiated uh, in the past for uh, fighter jet, uh, uh, fighter jets uh, planes, and um, it um, has been introduced there to put uh, very important information and navigation information on the windscreen. Um, it enables to read information uh, while looking and still focusing on the environment instead of looking down to uh, the, the dashboard. It um, has been taken a while after that um, people have started to, um, to implement it in cars. Uh, that was around the 50s. But it took until the 90s until that um, it was really offered uh, in cars. But if we are honest, it's only recently that we see a lot of uh, uh, demand and also um, change and offering into head-up displays. So uh, today what we see is that um, it's um, offered in luxury cars, but it's shifting towards uh, the more uh, commodity cars um, and there are a few reasons for that um, the reason is um, in the change or I see two reasons the first reason is that uh, we are looking for safer cars as you know um, the uh, traffic um, accidents they are uh, one of the biggest cause of that in, in the world and um, so, for example, every day, every single day, there is one jumbo jet, uh, seven jumbo jets, uh, sorry, uh, which is 3,200 people which are killed in traffic. And of course, uh, the, the governments, they want to change this, and that's one, one big drive. Another driver is the customer experience. And the big changes we have today in, this, uh, in the automotive world, the, this disruption uh, which is happening with the electrification connected and shared and later on the autonomous um, a lot of information is captured by the cameras the leaders and so on and it uh, will be given um, this information will be captured and given uh, towards the driver by means of head-up display so head-up display becomes a very important aspect of the advanced driver assistance systems. And uh, you can imagine that um, the windscreen is a very important part of the head of display system because at the end, what you do is you, you're going to uh, <clears throat> put the image on the windscreen. So the quality of the windscreen is then of a big importance, of course, to, um, to have a good quality uh, projection there on the windscreen. Today the windscreen uh, adoption rate is um, still on the lower side, it's uh, 5%, but one is expecting uh, a big growth of 25% over the coming five years. For example, in the ID3 Volkswagen, um, it will be also, or is also uh, implemented. <clears throat> So today I'm um, very pleased um, to uh, present you two speakers. Um, so we have uh, Frank de Ridder. Frank de Ridder is uh, the application manager for Beckard team. 
so for the customers uh, to give uh, application support to our customer base. And he will talk about the impact of the glass banding, uh, the glass banding processes uh, towards the uh, quality of the windscreen for head up display. And then the second speaker is uh, Bart van Laren. Bart van Laren is an uh, application uh, development engineer and he is um, talking today about the PVB uh, implementation and impact of the PVB and the laminated windshield uh, onto the, the quality of the head up display. Before we start with the first speaker, um, some practical aspects. Um, so there is a chat box, um, and this chat box, um, there you can put your questions. So the questions will be visible for our team. Um, and we will come back on that um, at the end of the two, after the two speakers have done their presentation. So then we will treat the different questions which are coming in, in the chat box. <clears throat> Further on, uh, the session will be recorded and all the participants will get a link afterwards uh, to review uh, the presentations if they wish to. Then um, I hope you have um, a very, very good uh, webinar. In the next hour, feel free to put your questions in the, in the chat box and uh, I give the word to the first speaker, uh, Frank. The floor is yours. Thank you, Johan. Um, yeah, like Johan explained already, um, if we look to, let's say, the head-up display objectives, uh, it's all about safety. Yeah? If we look to the, let's say, yeah, why should we use a head-up display? Yeah, uh, it's to have projected information in a driver view to improve the safety. And it's also to ensure the visibility of information in ambient conditions like fog, uh, rain or snow. Uh, it allows it allow also the driver to remain focused on the road while reading, so not reading his mobile phone when he is driving, for example. So it's all about safety. Um, if we look uh, and if we go back to the future from head-up display to augmented and reality head-up display, then we can say, okay, it started in 1966 uh, with a very small um, projection of the speed in the glass and and if you look to the glass from that time the glass is not looking very good and you can see that yeah that uh, the the numbers are let's say not really good projected into the glass itself uh, if you look then to 1988 to 1992 um there was some progress made uh, where you can again see the uh, the speed limit is projected in the window and it's interesting to see, okay, that in 8080, you can see above a picture of a car of 8080 and the same picture above in 92 with another car. So not really a big in innovation step was taken at that time. But then you can see that from, from the 19, let's say from 2000 until now, then you can see that it's speeding up. So you can see that um, you had these this small screens in the, on the dashboard from 2000. And then from 2005, you can see there is a big innovative step uh, where you can clearly see that uh, everything is projected into the glass in a 2D and then in 2020 it's already 3D and also not only the speed limit is, is projected in there also the GPS also other things can be projected and in the near future uh, you can see that you will go to like a hologram that is projected into your into your um, your wind windshield and it will yeah, project every dangerous situation that can happen will can can be projected onto the glass so so what is the principle of an, an augmented reality head of display so first of all um, what you need is yeah you need um, a projector system and uh, this is um, like something that is projecting into a fold mirror and also an aspheric um, uh, mirror and um, so and this will be projected in the windshield so um, moment okay sorry on the windshield so a laminated windshield and um, when it's projected in the laminated windshield the quality should be very perfect and huh? it should be a very good class compatibility between the inner and the outer but also the optics has to be perfect otherwise you will see some some strange things in the uh, yeah, in the projection on your windscreen so, um, okay, what are the head-up uh, head display systems on the market? So if you see, you have, let's say, uh, on the projection systems, you have a traditional, um, 
yeah, you have a traditional fixed X, A, Z uh, projection. You also can have the new ones, the augmented reality. This is a variable X, A, and Z projection. You also have the image. Uh, you have in the, in the traditional one, most of the cases, you have the 2D flat image. But you can also have them in augmented reality. You can also have the 2D flat image. Uh, but more and more, you can see that they are working with the 3D image, and that will be also the future. If you look to the different projection systems that there are, um, there you can see that you have a laser, a display, and the other is a kind of, let's say, um, let's see, then you also have uh, something else. So the laser, the display, and then one moment, I have to have a look, oh, sorry. I lost my screen. What happened? Okay, it's back. So, uh, and you have three kind of system um, that you can use to project uh, into, into the project screen. You see that more and more the windshield is used, let's say, as a projector uh, screen. Um, and this will also mean that the, the display sizes that are used, let's say, to project something into the, um, into the screen are, let's say, getting more and more uh, larger, in fact. Uh, you can see here again, you have laser display, and the other one is the projector. So, um, okay. So if we look, let's say, to the head of display, um, let's say the, the size of that, the field of view, then you can see that in 2010, you have re relatively small ones, like 4.5 degree um, by 1.5 degree. And if you now look in 2020, we go over, let's say, the 10 degrees and, and in horizontal way, you can see that you go, let's say, like for a degree angle and even more. Uh, so what is the field of view? The field of view is the open observable area of a person that can see through his eyes or her eyes and or via an optical device. And it's um, described by an angle. Huh? So this is what you see. You can see that overall, you can see that the, the image is getting larger by time, let's say. And, future and if we see the difference let's say if we look to the difference between a conventional 2d AR, AR sorry head up display and a 3d AR head up display and what is the difference you can see that for a 2d and um, your let's say the, the fixed area or the information position is in fact fixed uh, yeah it's the fixed distance to the eye of the person so that means then when um, this this uh, distance or let's say this eye point is, is inappropriate, then you will see that there will be a shift into, into your windshield. So it means that the position is not really um, very good located. So with the 3D AR head up display, you can see that the information position is a variable position. So it will adapt always to the position of the person in the car. So uh, normally like a a normal person can cannot distinguish maybe the distance between a pedestrian and a car, for example, like you see in this in this example. But if you have a 3D, then you will clearly see that this is um, be projected as a 3D animation into your uh, windshield. That's what you see here with this kind of um, pictures here at, at the right side. You can see that these two pedestrians um, are here from a certain distance from each other. If you put, let's say, like uh, this green uh, area around it, you can clearly see with your eye that this is, let's say, a position that is shift from each other. And this is also something that can be interesting, like, for example, in the picture below, and this is from a Toyota. Um, you can see clearly at your right side, there is a parking spot, and also on your left side, there is also a parking spot. So you can predict, in fact, okay, the camera can predict, okay, there is a parking spot over there. You can say, okay, I have so many meters that I have to go to the car, to the, the parking spot, and you can already be, um, yeah, you can already prepare to park. So, but there are some set challenges since all this 3D and this, this, yeah, this um, head up display um, projection into a glass. So, first of all, yeah, you can have distortion, that's what you see here. You can have a ghosting, and you can have. Um, Character uniformity should be okay. Uh, so between letters and numbers. So you can also have, let's say, the pixel resolution of symbols has to be improved. And also the contrast uh, between daylight, nightlight, um, summertime, wintertime, all these kind of things will play a role in, let's say, in yeah, the best projection of your, let's say, yeah, your head up display or your, your, your information onto your um, windshields. 
And same challenges, but uh, there is a, a clearly demand for better systems to, to measure all these kind of things. So uh, not only on the laminated glass, but only but also further in the process, for example, uh, like you would see, like for example, uh, let's say in the bending of the glass. If you look to ghost image, for example, and if you look to a traditional laminated glass where you have, let's say, an inner and an outer um, glass with in the middle a PVB foil, uh, when it's like that, like it's just a traditional, um, yeah, traditional laminated glass, you can see that the ghost image and your virtual image is not at the same line. So this is giving you a kind of distortion. Um, we know that from, from the past, let's say the, let's say the last um, five to 10 years, um, yeah, the, the laminators are working on that and you can see that uh, they came up with a kind of solution and this is what we call the windshield with the wedge. So what is a wedge? So you can see that there will be, let's say, a PVB foil in between the inner and the outer um, glasses in a certain angle. So by doing that, your focus point from the virtual image and the ghost image are falling in the same line. So, and this is not creating the distortion. So this is what we call a single wedge uh, and future things. And, and Bart will come later on that from, from Eastman. He will explain more about, let's say, the, um, yeah, the, the, the future things that will come up uh, to have, let's say, a better head-up display um, result. And if we look, I already told, so the bending process is quite important in all this. So, so and, and not only the bending, let's say, of a laminated, uh, combined laminated glass, but also uh, the bending of the inner and the outer glass. Because after, after, um, yeah, after the bending, these glasses are combined uh, with each other and together with the PVB foil. And at the end, they go in the autoclave and they have to, yeah, have to have a very good result, let's say, in the optical um, distortion. Uh, you can have two bending um, applications, so it can have a kind of gravity sec um, plus a press bend at the end, but also you can have single press bend applications where you have the inner and the outer are pressed, not at the same time, but after each other. For the gravity sec, there you have two glasses at the same time that are pressed. Um, depending on the, on the application, this will also have an impact on, let's say, the end quality and the end optical quality of the glass itself. And if you look to the influence on a glass shape and the optics on head-up display, then you can say, okay, we have three things that are quite important. One is the furnace, is it for the furnace process so, and the settings of the furnace. So where you can see also the different settings between a single press band versus a gravity sack. And there you have, let's say, the reflective distortion, the transmitted distortion and the gauging. So these are quite important things, let's say, on a glass to have, a let's say, to have the best an optical quality in your glass. So this is typically a picture that you can see for a head-up display where you have, let's say, an, a measurement system where you have a lot of points that are measuring, in fact, the, the height of the glass. So, um, so this is typically what you see to measure a gauging, uh, let's say, in, in, say in, for a head-up display glass. Another thing is the thickness of the raw glass quality. And it's, it's uh, obvious that when you have, let's say, uh, scrap in, you will also have scrap out. So what is important is there that your glass quality, uh, your inner and your outer glass quality is from you know, it's, it's perfect quality and that you also can measure that to see, okay, what is the end quality? Like for example, um, we will look there to local thickness variations, but also to the vertical distortion um, in transmission, for example, but also maybe in reflection to see the, draw the drawing lines of the thin battery that can play a role um, after then in the optical quality, especially in transmission. And this is, uh, this is an example of, let's say, uh, four um, yeah, single, um, single plies uh, where you can see a glass from the inner ply and then a glass of the outer ply. So four glasses on the inner ply, four glasses on the outer ply. You can see the different colors of lines. So here you can see there is a very big difference in thickness variation between the inner glass and the outer glass. Uh, uh, you even can see, if you look to the orange one, you can see that there are still two, that you, that you can notice two bumps. So this is something that if you then combine this together with the inner glass, you will notice this in your reflective optics. Um, and also in the transmission optics, you can already see a difference when you have something like this. So when this is variating too much, you will also uh, can forget that you have at the end that you will have, let's say, a very good optical quality um, on your laminated windshield. Because if you have this, the PVB will follow, in fact, the result of the two um, inner and outer glasses and will follow, in fact, the thickness variations into the glass. 
Another thing is the clot. Uh, okay, what kind of clot can you use to uh, to improve, let's say, the the bending process and or the glass quality in the bending process? Uh, what is important in that to mention is that um, yeah. The clot will, will press, in fact, um, your glass and it will be in contact with your glass. So, and it will also create some local thickness variations into your glass. Um, very minor, right? it's on a scale of, of microns and not really on a scale of millimeters, um, but it will have an, a very big impact on the reflective distortion and also on the transmitted distortion and also on the thickness variation. Above, you can see um, a picture of a glass. Um, for the reflectors measured by reflective optics you can see that the grid is projected into the glass and you can see that the lines are shifting that means that you have let's say an optical distortion and then you can see a picture from an isra system and uh, where you can see the difference between the green and the red lines so this means that you have a kind of conve con and concave and convex and uh, lens differences so there you will have the, the, dis the distortion in transmission okay then we go, let's say, what is now uh, the core business of Baycard and how can Baycard help in that? So Baycard is, not, is still the market leader of, let's say, of the clots, uh, mold clots that is coming in contact with glass. So we are developing different clots for different applications and also on the request of our customers. And uh, our clots have a high resistance and uh, heat, have a high heat resistant um, performance they can also have let's say a high abrasion resistant performance they have an excellent damping with the mold and the glass they are very soft um, also at a high temperature and they have also a long lifetime what at the end is below is, is an important let's say for the total cost of ownership of our customers so and it should be a certain high air permeability and um, what do i mean by that because if you have the glass and the glass is is blended, you have a certain vacuum that has to grow through the plot. So to pick the glass, let's say, up to uh, to bend on the mold. So uh, it's important that this high that this perme permeability is quite important. Let's say to have a soft contact with uh, your clot with the mold. And if we look, let's say, um, what are the, the the most important features, let's say, for this, um, this this glass bending and the mold covering of a clot? Again, the glass compatibility. So inner and outer should have let's say the same uh, same shape um, and then also the high optics what is important optics in transmission optics in reflection and also can should be very stretchable to cover let's say complex designs of the mold you can see here a mold that is quite complex let's say on the pillar sides quite deep angle so and also the shape conformity so after that it should be very good let's say it has a good shape um, after that so that the wiper is not let's say drilling, let's say, on your windshield, for example. Um, yeah, we did some work in the past, an experimental work done by our R&D department, where we looked, in fact, to the characterizations of steel knitted clots and on molds. Uh, you can see that, okay, if you put a clot onto a mold, so what happened, let's say, with this clot, and what impact does it have on the optics? And what we did is we, we looked uh, mainly to the elongation of the clot, the compression of the clot, and the shear angle of the clot. So all this we, 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 yeah, we did some experience on, and then we, we, we did some measurements on to see, okay, what is that the anti-impact on an optic, on the optics, and especially on the optics in transmission in this case. Because you can see if you, if you have a knitted clot, uh, like a very, it's very stretchable, you can see if you put that on a mold, then you will see that and you will notice that in the middle it will be different than at the side. So what we could see is so we we yeah we did a kind of experiment and that we did a finite element simulation of the draping. And there we looked mainly to the strain distribution and also the thickness distribution of the clot onto a mold. Um, and what we saw is that yeah, if, if you put that on a mold, you can see that there are some different, if you look to the colors, you can see that the colors are different, let's say on the pillar side and also on the on the, the cowl side and on the top side. So that means that you have there um, a difference in airflow, let's say of the clot and also of the air during the vacuum when you pick up the glass. So that can also impact your, um, yeah, your optical quality into the glass. If we look to the strain distribution there, we see more or less the same that you have, let's say a different kind of thickness um, at the sides, so let's say on the pillar sides, on the cowl and also on the top. So that's also we have to keep in mind that when you start to um, press glass, that this can also um, create some, 
some, let's say, local thickness variations into your glass. So that's um, the outcome of that was quite interesting to see that the kind of pre strain was necessary. So you can see that, that with Baycart we can do a lot of things and we are, let's say, pleased to work together with you if you have some questions. Um, so we are really pleased to, yeah, to answer your questions. And if you want to cooperate with us, yeah, we are always open to talk uh, with each other. So I would like to thank you. We are at the end of my presentation. I would like to thank you uh, for the attention. And if there are any questions, I'm pleased to ask. OK, thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you for this uh, interesting presentation. Like I said, uh, we will come back on the questions in the Q&A session at the end of, um, of this webinar. Um, and so I want to give the word now to uh, Bart, uh, Bart van Laren from Eastman. Bart, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joa. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are on the globe. Uh, today, I want to highlight a little bit on uh, what are the trends and what are the solutions for head of display in the market. So depending on which literature you read, you can find all kinds of different abbreviations uh, to highlight the trends in the automotive industry of today. Uh, we use uh, the CASE um, abbreviation, where CASE stands for Connected, Autonomous, Shared and Electrified. And today we're going to speak a little bit more in detail on the autonomous part. Um, as most of you most probably knew, uh, we divide the autonomous level of uh, the automotive or of the car in six different uh, segments, uh, calling from zero to five, where zero, one and three, the driver is still under control of the driving. And from level three, four and surely five, it's more the car who takes over control to having the full control. So level one is really nothing is happening, no information is displayed. Level, um, um, excuse me, level zero. Level one is really like what you know about uh, the cruise control, giving a speed limit and these kind of things. Um, when we talk about uh, level three and four, uh, more autonomous uh, systems like uh, lane assistance come into the picture and we see some examples uh, later on. How does head of display play in here? Um, we have seen the trends of uh, yeah, very small displays projected in front of the driver monochrome in the past. Today, uh, this is uh, history. Today we have nicely full colored displays um, and depending on, let's say, which level of automation, which level of car uh, it's uh, presented, we see cars with a field of view which is growing. Um, so you can see, for example, uh, the first picture and the second picture. It's the same kind of information which is projected on a larger field of view, um, which means a larger uh, area. Um, which allows also to project more information, so not just uh, the driving assistance, not just the speed, but also all kind of information of upcoming uh, upcoming things in, in front, like a restaurant or a pedestrian, these kind of stuff. This is pretty common today. This is the head of display systems, which you can find in uh, multiple cars today. Um, but the next trend is to even have a more larger field of view. So compared to the first one, it's easily four to five times uh, bigger and also to go to longer virtual image distances. So not just in front of the car, a kind of 2D projection, but really have uh, a projector further away indicating which kind of uh, events that you could encounter. And the next step is even having a combination of both and in the next generation, uh, holographic uh, projections will be introduced. So Eastman has been uh, playing on this market uh, from in the beginning, starting to try to align uh, the, the two images, uh, because if you project on a glass and you have a double glass and a windshield, uh, you have two projection screens, so you will see two images. So if you don't uh, take any precaution, uh, you will see both images, which uh, what we call a double image. So Eastman introduced a PVB, 
where an interlayer to glue the glasses together, where the thin side is on the bottom and it's growing in thickness uh, towards the uh, top. And the purpose is there to align two images. So still the two images are there, but the driver sees only one because the two images are nicely aligned. As cars became, let's say, more silent, uh, more comfort was needed, Eastman introduced uh, around 2009 a similar interface, but with acoustic performance. So you see in the middle, there is an acoustic layer, which brings uh, a nicer uh, sound level to, uh, into the car. Next generation was adding a gradient band in blue, gray or green, depending on the customer needs. But if we look to these three interlayers, they are mainly adapted to the nominal driver. So it means that uh, average uh, people um, didn't see a double image because the PVV was fine-tuned in thickness uh, for that average uh, person. Um, but if you were unlucky and you were a little bit uh, longer or you were a little bit shorter, you could be suffering from uh, a double image of a ghosting, uh, as we call it. So Eastman investigated uh, on how to solve this, how to obtain an image which was uh, good for uh, more drivers, for let's say all drivers, and in 2017, we introduced uh, what we call View ST, which is a PVB, which has a different thickness profile along the PVB sheet. Um, having this uh, different thickness profile, we could make different uh, angles. And as such, we could create an optimal for the different uh, type of drivers in the same car. In the right bottom, you see an example where the red line is the thickness profile um, seen from the, if you go to the left, to the right, you see first the bottom of the windshield and you see on the right, the top of the windshield, you see the thickness is growing. And related to this, the wedge angle uh, marked in blue is changing over the head of the display zone. So this enables uh, to have a good viewing for all drivers, uh, but it also enables to have a larger field of view. Here an example of a real case um, where you see the field of view is becoming bigger. Multiple cameras are used to verify, let's say, what is the image, what is the ghosting, where you measure the difference between, let's say, the first image and the second image. And for example, the nominal driver is specified by camera three, four, nine, and 10. Um, and the dev maximum allowed deviations are specified by the dotted lines. So you see it's nicely in. And um, if you look to the short and the tall driver, you will see that if you would use the same uh, tolerances, sometimes you pop out. Uh, so it means that uh, if you're a short driver or a tall driver, that your image will not be so nice as for the nominal driver. So by adapting and introducing the view ST, um, you see the blue line on the same type of windshield, and you see it's for all the drivers, they uh, obtain a very good uh, image. So this was a small part on different PVB types, which can help you in uh, getting to better performance of a head of display windshield. Uh, of course, uh, everything starts with raw material, uh, like also Frank stated from, from the glass, but processing is uh, very important too. So over the years, um, due to the fact that the head of display has a different thickness, it implements some uh, particular problems to cope with and to, to take precautions. So if you just cut the PVB from roll to sheet size, there is a high probability that you obtain wrinkles and in worst case, even plies. Wrinkles can cause optical distortion. And of course, a head of display is a projection system. So the last thing you want is having optical distortions. And plies can do the same, but even worse in some cases cause glass breakage. So in any case, both the phenomena can cause yield losses at the lamination site, uh, which of course are to be prevented. By um, putting the PVB uh, in a preconditioning, uh, meaning in general about one, two days at the 20 degrees, the PVB becomes more soft 
and easier to transform from roll to sheet size, which is improving the yield significantly. A second step is um, after the, pre, the PVB is uh, preconditioned, is perform a pre-relaxation of the PVB. So after the preconditioning, the PVB is a little bit more soft, but still uh, wrinkles are uh, available. You can see them. And if you want to stretch or shape the PVB, it's recommended to have that nicely flat on the heating devices. So to obtain this pre-relaxation can, can help a lot. Um, pre-relaxation, what does it mean? It's like heating up the PVB between 30 and 60 degrees uh, as soon as possible after the unwinding. So it can be before an accumulator. If you don't have, have an accumulator, it can be uh, after you have been uh, splicing the PVB rolls, but as soon as possible, giving the PVB uh, the time to act and to become fully, let's say, relaxed, pre-relaxed prior you heat it up to the shaping temperatures of the lamination line. Here you can see an example of a PVB, uh, let's say, without taking any precautions. When you take the PVB out of the cold room and you start processing, this is a typically ply which you get where you can clearly notice, I think, uh, the waves. If you precondition the PVB, you still can see waves, but it's already much, much better. And if you precondition, pre-relax the PVB, you obtain a flat PVB where it's, if you have a single ply of PVB, it's very hard to see the difference with a traditional PVB, an acoustic or a non-acoustic. And uh, you can compare the yield level with standard production. So what does it mean? Um, raw materials are very important for the final result. So if we want to go to augmented reality and we are going to longer virtual image distances, uh, I think it's clear that tolerances uh, must be pretty tight because they are uh, magnified over, uh, over the distance. So today we have a lot of applications like you see on the left side where information is projected to help the driver making decisions uh, to prevent the driver that uh, there needs to be a shift in direction to give information on speed, on speed limits, but it's information giving. The driver is on full control. The driver decides what to do with the information or to not to do with the information. And we talk about Augmented reality, head of display, when we talk about uh, autonomous driving and these kind of things, the situation is a little bit different. It's not projected just in front of the car anymore. The virtual image distance is what's needed to prevent the driver or the person in the driver's seat what will happen. But it could be fully be that the car is driving autonomous and just giving an indication of what the car is intended to do. So if we look to the example on the right, you can, for example, see the red curtain indicating this is the end of the road. Just in front of the car, there is another car. We are coming closer and the car is giving the information to the person in the driver's seats. We are approaching, I'm gonna take over. And you can see on the green arrow what exactly the car is intended to do. And he also warns that he has seen that there is a turn. Um, but the car can be, do this fully autonomous and in let's say level three four the driver can still take over but if he feel comfortable he can just uh, leave the car do the job so in the autonomous level three and four um, these improved safety uh, requirements are required because i think that none of us for the moment is already very comfortable in having a car taking decisions without knowing what will be happening. So projecting this kind of information uh, of what the car is intended to do is very important in these kind of uh, applications. And for this, if we go to longer virtual image uh, distances, uh, tighter tolerances, tighter specifications of the OEMs are put in place. And um, I'm happy that we can, uh, that I can tell that Eastman is following this trend, that we have been investigating and testing different extrusion techniques on to see how we can obtain these tighter tolerances. 
and we will be able to launch a product uh, very soon in uh, 2021, fulfilling the needs for Augmented Reality Hut. So if you have any challenge in this kind of area, most probably we have a solution. So don't forget to contact us. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. Uh, thank you for uh, giving these insights and uh, information on uh, the products and how to apply them and what is important. Um, we got some uh, interesting uh, questions in, so I will try to uh, bring them to the correct uh, speaker. So, uh, Frank, uh, the first questions, and it's a little bit, um, I will pose them twofold to you. It's about uh, what technology to use um, for the um, uh, for the glass bending, in fact. Um, so, a question uh, from uh, Selsuk was: um, Can uh, sec bending be used, and um, is there a pre-assist um, mm -hmm. um, pre-assist uh, press necessary to do so? That's the first part of the question. And the second part, which is a little bit uh, related to that, and it's a question that came from Goron, it's um, can, uh, without press band technology, uh, windshields be made for head-up display and the future head-up display uh, requests and, and objects? Okay, uh, and it's, it's good questions, I have to say. Uh, and if you look to the mark, let's say, and you see to the gravity side, what was in fact an older technology, um, yeah, where you can make, let's say, very good windshields, big windshields. And what we see, and this is the experience we have, is that uh, within Baycart then, that we see more and more that the trend is going, let's say, to press bend, um, yeah, single press bend uh, windshield pressing. Um, difficult question to say what is the best one. And um, I, I can imagine that if you need, to, let's say, the right shape, and that shape is, is, is important, like the coaching, for example, and I, I can imagine that, um, that that you can have it more under control by, let's say, maybe press bending, because there you always have the same mold and your glass is always the same shape. Um, it should be the same shape. And, and you can have it, you can give it a pressing. And like I, I explained, and this is a maybe a hypothetical question, or let's say an assumption, is that if you see the different thickness variations of your glass and you just put two glasses on each other, and you just give it a gravity sack, yeah, you will still have, let's say, this kind of thickness variation into your glass. So the question is, 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 can this be then pressed out if you if you press the glass, or let's say, can you limit it? Let's say if you press the glass with an outer furnace press band uh, furnace, something I don't know, uh, something that we have to more have to look more in detail. But um, there is a difference between the both the both uh, systems, that for sure. So uh, and, and what we see is that also what we see that there from the OEM that there is a trend to go, let's say, from gravity sack uh, or gravity sack, especially from gravity sack to a gravity sack plus press bend, or let's say a single press bend uh, furnace. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you, Frank. So uh, another question which came in, it's, I think it's a rather easy one for you, Bart, is uh, what does the ST stand, uh, stand for in uh, the name of uh, the PVB foil? Might be that you're uh, that you're still muted, uh, Bart. Yeah, the mic was still off, so that's not a good idea <clears throat> if you want to respond. <laughs> uh, you know that at Eastman we are very good in uh, making all kind of namings, and so it's it's just a brand name to differentiate all the different uh, PVBs, and uh, because this is really extending the view, um, it's just a, in a name. I wouldn't uh, look to very much, uh, let's say, explanation for that. Okay, then uh, another question for Frank. It's uh, the question who is coming from Bartolome. It's um, what type of cover materials will help uh, to achieve a smooth glass surface uh, for uh, for head of display? Um, depending on the on the type of your glass again, uh, depending on the thickness of the glass, the, the complexity of the glass. Uh, we have different kind of, of, of let's say, materials available for that. So, and if you have, like, like for example, if you have to cover, let's say, an, uh, a very complex mold, 
Um, you have to take in into care that you need, let's say, the air, the air permeability should be good. The, the thickness variation overall on the clot should be good. So yeah, we have different kind of clots uh, with different kind of stretch behaviors that can help on that. So to pick out one clot that is good for everything, it's quite difficult. It's something that we, we tried already for years, but uh, it's quite difficult because all furnaces and also the settings of the furnace are also quite important. For example, your vacuum pickup, um, all these kind of things, uh, say the press of your, your press ring, for example, I don't know, so the tooling, uh, all these kind of things, yeah, are, let's say, quite important, and let's say, to choose the right clot. Um, so we see some different different type of clots used, let's say, on, on let's say, different type of applications um, where we can draw a line in, but it's not easy to say, okay, you need to have this clot for this typical kind of application or that glass. It depends on your, your glass complexity also and the settings of the furnace. So um, I think, I hope that this is an answer on your question, Bartolomeo. Okay, well, I think uh, anyways, I mean, if you want to go a little bit deeper into uh, the subject, uh, it's always possible to have uh, to connect with the speakers afterwards uh, via email. Um, I think then you can get more appropriate information and more detailed information, of course. Um, a question which is coming from Anil, and it's also for, uh, for you, Frank, is... Um, uh, yeah, press bending has, of course, a very high capital cost. Um, are there intermediate solutions uh, available, or um, is that the way uh, people have to go? Huh. Well, we know that that, uh, that are our furnace makers that have, let's say, uh, that can rebuild their gravity sack by, by putting a press at the end. But honestly, I, I, I don't have the experience to say, okay, uh, do you really need a press bent lamination? Yeah, depending on, on the glasses you make and the tolerance, there will be a point at a certain moment that some applications yeah, are not able to make, let's say, the, the, uh, the OEM's glass that they are asking in the future, I think. That's for sure. Yeah. Okay. So another question for, um, for Bart. Uh, uh, it's a question which is coming from Emilio. It's, um, which are the shape tolerances uh, within the head-up display that uh, one has to uh, to focus on or what are necessary? Do you have an idea about that? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it depends on how you interpret what are shape tolerances. Is the question how much can you shape it or what will be the tolerances after shaping? Um, so I think maybe the best way is that we talk to um, by email or we have a closer discussion just to understand the question better um, but i can tell in general uh, if your shaping is a process is under control um, while shaping you reduce the tolerances um, so you get better performance of course uh, if you start from something which is bad uh, it will always be bad and if your process is not well under control you can make it worse than it is so it really depends. We have a specification on, on tolerances and we try to make products with tighter tolerances to, let's say, to enable the virtual uh, distance to be longer and to obtain a larger field of view. Um, but anyway, depending on how shaping is performed, uh, you can, let's say, stabilize and uh, keep the kind of tolerances or, let's say, you can introduce fluctuations. Okay, good. Um, I have a question. I think I can pose it to you both, but maybe I, I start with you, Bart, and then we can go over to Frank. A question from David is um, uh, relative to, to the driver, um, the exterior glass. Um, so the, the surface quality um, of the exterior glass or the quality in general of the exterior glass, does it play a role in head-up display quality, yes or no? Personally, I would say yes, but in which kind of degree, that's difficult to, let's say, to indicate. Um, uh, we've seen already that uh, different, so let's say, glass thicknesses or different bending performance have uh, an influence. And also the second glass is acting as a kind of uh, second screen. Uh, is it coated or not? So there are a lot of influences. So I would say personally, yes. Do we have all the data to prove 
how much and whatever, it really depends on the application. I don't know. Okay, if Frank, yes. maybe something to, to add to that? I, I think absolutely, because it's I2 that is coming mostly in contact with your uh, molds and also with the clots. And you also have the vacuum over there. So different kind of vacuums can give you different kind of variation into your glass shape. Um, absolutely, yeah. And if you have then coated glasses and coated glasses that are all, let's say, also coming in contact on site too, coating on site too, and coming in contact with our glass will also have, um, yeah, have an effect on the glass quality, in fact. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so an, uh, a further question is a question from Yarek. Um, uh, and the question is, um, are you working on any materials, interlayer materials that would support the holographic display? So uh, that's a question for Bart. That's a good question. Uh, we are looking to old friends, um, but I think currently I'm not in the position to reveal a lot which trends we are following closer than the other one. Okay. I get some uh, information that the voices are a little bit interfering with each other, so maybe we have to put out the micro when we are not talking. So that's um, uh, something which might help this. Um, so I hope the, the question uh, was answered by this. So if not, uh, please uh, feel free to contact uh, the speakers afterwards. Uh, another question, um, I think it's a question, I'm just looking to it. Um, coated heated windshields. Um, so it's probably a, a, the impact of uh, coating and sulfur paste, uh, which is on the third phase, and which is, of course, part of the bending process. Um, so, the, the, yeah, so what is, what is the impact of the presence of... Uh, coating and uh, silver paste on, on the bending process. It's one for you, Frank. Important, eh? if you if you put your coating on side two, and, and most of the cases is on side two when you press the glass. So um, what is important is that you have, let's say, um, the right temperature during your tunnel, for example, eh? um, because this coating um, is so you always need to have, let's say, like a convection and, a, and, and a radiation in your furnace to to um, yeah to 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 cure your coating completely onto the glass. Eh? Um, otherwise, you can you can harm your coating during press bending um, process. So so a good curing of the coating is quite important. And also, let's say our cloth can help in in to yeah, to protect let's say the the bending um, of a coated glass. Eh? Yeah, in, yeah. It's especially your temperature in your tunnel should be let's say your temperature flux or your temperature uh, should be quite, let's say, good, let's say, under control in the, in the tunnel. Because your coating is reflecting. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I, I noticed that uh, we lost a little bit of connection with you, Frank, but okay, I think we, we move on. Um, so, um, a question from John Pablo. Um, uh, the new interlayer being developed by Eastman specifically for uh, augmented reality head-up systems. Um, so, is that focusing and meeting tighter tolerances, or does it offer any other features uh, features to support uh, augmented reality? Uh, Bart, that's one for you. It's mainly focusing on tighter tolerances to enable uh, longer virtual image uh, distances and to have a larger field of view. So okay. On tolerances. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, um, I would say we uh, we finish up with, uh, with the last question. Um, so to you both speakers, how fast do you think that uh, augmented reality head of this place will find the way um, in, in, in the business and uh, being adopted? Um, do you have some, some view or idea on that? So maybe Bart? I think your mic is, uh, mic is out, uh, Bart. 
Yeah, sorry, on you broke up, so I didn't hear you. Sorry. Can you repeat? Okay, the so um, the question was, uh, how um, fast do you think that augmented reality head-up display will be adopted and implemented um, in in cars? Um, do you have a certain idea or opinion about that? Well, it's going on. It's just happening right now. So I have an idea about it. Yes, it's happening today. <laughs> okay. Good. Frank, you have uh, something to add on that? Already going on. So uh, and first, I think, first the OEMs will come on the market with it. So with the coming years, yeah. even maybe next year, coming years. Yeah. It's the future. Okay. Good. So I think we are coming to, uh, to the end of this talk. Um, I think uh, what was presented today, uh, very interesting. Thank you, speakers, for bringing your message and your information. Um, so I, uh, it, it made clear that there is quite some challenges uh, as well for the glass makers as, uh, as for us as suppliers um, and OEM who want to implement uh, all these techniques in the car that um, working together will be the message uh, for the future. Um, and uh, not in the last minute, but really partnering up uh, to, to, to work on uh, substantial uh, improvements uh, to make this all happen in the short period uh, that is necessary. So um, that's why we, we are reaching out to, uh, to all of you um, for uh, partnering up with, uh, with uh, Beckert and also with Eastman. Um, to, uh, to bring it to a higher level. So uh, thank you attendees uh, for being in this uh, webinar. I hope you enjoyed uh, listening to, to the speakers in this last hour. Um, there will definitely coming more of these webinars in the future. Um, and uh, like I said, the, the, the recording of the, of the webinar, uh, there will be a link sent to you by email uh, after this uh, this webinar uh, so that if you want to you can uh, review it um, or uh, even uh, use it for for colleagues okay thank you very much uh, thank you bart uh, thank you uh, frank and thank you attendees and uh, looking forward to, to see you in future thank you bye-bye thank you, bye -bye. Thank, you um, thank frank bye